This is our last panel, and um, I'm very excited for this next panel. Um, it was organized by Laura Fry. She's our um, senior curator and curator of art at Gilchrist Museum. She comes to us from the Tacoma Art Museum in Washington and has specialized in American Western art for much of her career. So please help me welcome Laura Fry and the Tulsa Artist Fellows. Oh, hello. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thanks for to everyone who's sticking around through the uh, the whole symposium, um, and thank you also to Brian and to Sean and to Natalie and Alex for your hard work planning this event. Um, we really appreciate it. And I've been really impressed here by the sheer range of topics that we've explored um, over the last couple days. We've had psychologists and historians and poets and Bob Dylanologists, which I'm pretty sure is a made-up word, but it works. <laughs> and so for our final panel this afternoon, we're taking a little different uh, tack, and we're adding another dimension to these discussions about uh, migration and displacement that we've been hearing about the past couple days. And in January 2016, about three weeks after I moved from Seattle to Tulsa, I met the inaugural class of Tulsa Artist Fellows. And the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, if you're not familiar, was established in 2015 by the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, and this is a fellowship to recruit visual and literary artists to Tulsa, where they have creative freedom to pursue their practice while contributing to the local arts community. The fellowship provides a stipend, free housing, a free studio for one year, with an option to extend the fellowship for up to an additional two years. And they're recruiting between five and 15 people to each discipline each year. So this fellowship is still pretty new. It's now in its third year. And uh, the program now includes artists and writers from across the United States and even from across the globe. Uh, and the program is based in the newly renovated refinery building at MLK and Archer in the Tulsa Arts District. And as I've gotten to know each successive group of, groups of fellows over the last couple years, one of the consistent themes that I've been seeing from many of them is this idea of migration. Uh, of course, this whole group, many of them moved to Tulsa to participate in this fellowship, so there's migration in that sense. Um, but far beyond that, uh, this group of artists is extremely well-traveled. Many of them have participated in numerous artist residency programs all across the United States and across the world. And so in the context of migrations, I assembled this panel to explore how migration and dislocation affect contemporary artists. And for this panel, each artist will make a brief presentation about their work to give you some sense of their background. And then that'll be followed by a moderated discussion. And we'll consider how migrating to Tulsa can impact an artist's career. How artists can contribute to processing and understanding historic uh, migrations and dislocations. And also we'll think about how growth in the arts and artistic migration can impact places like Tulsa. And all of our speakers today are now part of the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, so they all reside here in Tulsa. And uh, I'll give a little background on each person and then invite each one of them to come up and get, tell you a little bit more about their work. Uh, so first up, we'll have Emily Chase. Uh, and she was born in New York State, grew up crisscrossing the country before eventually settling in Oklahoma and in Arkansas. She has a BFA in painting from the University of Arkansas. And her recent work focuses on paper as sculptural media. And she uses it to explore her continued interest in narrative, ideas about home, and the relationship between clothing and identity. Uh, next up, we have Rafael Corzo. He was born in Mexico City and is now based in New York City. Um, he earned an MFA from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. And totally ambidextrous, Cortzo's creation expand to ceramics, drawing, painting, watercolor, sculpture, installations, metal casting, and neon lights. Next up is Megan Mosholder. And she's originally from Ohio, is currently based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Megan has an MFA in Fine Arts with a focus on painting from the Savannah College of Art and Design. And she is a conceptual artist who creates three-dimensional drawings, often enhanced with light. And these emphasize obscure elements within recognizable objects. And then finally, we have Moheb Solomon. 
Uh, he was born in Egypt and moved to Oklahoma as a kid before his family settled in Ohio. Uh, he's also lived in New York, Canada, and most recently Minneapolis. He earned an MA from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. And Moab is a poet and performance artist. He's interested in ideas of identity, modernity, belonging, and the limits of language in capturing human experience. So this is a talented bunch of very diverse artists working in several different media. And first I'll invite Emily to come up and share a little bit about her work. Hi everybody. Um, it's a little tall. Yes. <laughs> So I'm Emily Chase, which you know because Laura just told you that, um, but I said it again. So I, uh, I'm a paper artist. I make um, sculptures out of paper. Um, I have a background in painting, but um, sort of started, whoops, sorry, um, started using clothing as a medium to explore ideas about identity and communication. So what we wear often is the first way that we communicate with other people uh, visually about maybe where we're from or what we think is important or how we're feeling or how we want people to think we're feeling. Um, so when I was getting ready to come here today, I was, I was like very worried about getting dressed in the outfit that made me feel confident because I don't know if you guys uh, ever feel nervous when you're doing public speaking, but I did a little bit. So um, this piece was part of my um, undergraduate honors thesis. It's called Hollow Bones, sorry, and um, sort of exploring the ways in which um, we can use, it was part of a longer process, a project that I was using to explore the ways in which we can use cultural narratives like fairy tales to explain, uh, explore emotional processes like anxiety. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid and also traveled a lot and continued to travel a lot. I find that that uh, is really important in my work, thinking about place but also about um, the things that we carry around with us being part of our ideas of home. Um, so this is a pair of uh, gloves that I made out of maps, sort of thinking about traveling and um, recording and bringing those places with you. Um, also thinking about things like what, what does it mean to make a home? So this piece is an installation shot of two pieces. The piece at the top is called Shelter, and um, my grandmother is a quilter. She makes about 300 quilts a year um, and mostly donates them to like, the women's shelter in her town, the hospital. So for me, growing up, moving around so much, thinking about uh, important objects or heirlooms as what makes home home as opposed to a specific place or being rooted in a specific location. Um, I also do paper cutting work. This work also directly relates to this sort of continued moving around. So this um, figure has a little backpack that's shaped like a house, um, thinking about carrying around your home and having that be a part of you. And um, also thinking about things like growth and regrowth, this is also made out of paper. So this, this piece is called Slow Growth Bloom. So thinking about the ways in which growing can be uh, maybe painful but also positive and where you can be rooted in a place but also moving around. So it's just a little bitty introduction to my work. Um, I think we're gonna have a really good conversation so I'm really excited. Thank you for having me here today. Hello, everybody. Very happy. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for having us. Okay, um, basically, I'm gonna show you some videos, and um, and as I as they play, uh, I explain to you what what's the process. Okay, let me see. Okay. Oh. Okay, that was my um, MFA thesis at Alfred University. That was, um, I feel up the whole gallery. It's 70 by 45 feet. I use um, recyclable materials, ceramics. The color that you see there is because I have um, black lights and everybody entered the space with, with 3D glasses. So imagine three-dimensional three over three-dimensional. Like in the movies, you have people in front of the action. In this case, you were inside the action. No. 
um, the, the camera couldn't capture that total three-dimensionality, but you get an idea. Okay. The, okay. This, um, I started doing painting. Huh? One more time. Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit about that process. Um, um, I'm, as Laura said, I'm completely ambidextrous. The, I, we just passed a, a painting, but I did, it, did that one with my left foot. So, um, I, I have a video, I, I can show you some, some, some stuff. So I go from very figurative stuff to um, make it more abstract, more um, that's one of my sculptures, sketches of, of my sculptures. Um, so that's where it's going now. <laughs> it's, um, okay, okay. This video, on the, lev on the left side, I'm, I'm drawing backwards. On the other side, I'm drawing with both hands at the same time. So, um, so, some of those drawings that I'm doing there, they later become um, um, sculptures. But um, I try to, to draw, or I like to draw that way, not to worry about the, the technical aspects of, of how, how to make a sculpture. But um, I figured that out later on. Now I'm done. Um, so that was my both hands. And here on this video, I have one of my ceramic pieces. Um, I'm standing right there next to the, 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 the piece that's all ceramics made in sections. So um, I photographed myself next to the, the pieces so you can all have um, a sense of, of the scale. So on the video you can see that there, there perhaps you can see the uh, small sections. So ceramics can resist a lot in, in compression. You can make a whole building, right? But in extension, ceramics will break very easily. So th that's, that's part of the technical aspects that I like to solve to, to make my work more complex every time, every time. I like complexity. Um, if you research ceramic sculptures, you're gonna find that a lot of them are based on, on the base, right? But then in this case, um, this is uh, hand building. This in ceramics you will call this hand building. No. The the, the um, that brown brownish part it's, it's called magic sculpt. It's like a little kind of two parts epoxy where I can attach. You, you, on that piece you can detach everything and put it on a on a small SUV. That was. Um, that was my BFA at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, it's around a hundred something pieces. Um, I, um, I use uh, um, fluorescent uh, uh, um, mason stains and a Spanish red iron oxide on top of, of the clay. I, I make my own my own clay, my own clay body. I have my own formula, which is, is for this type of sculptures. It has a lot of grog, of minerals, something that is called kyanite. It's a mineral that absorbs well the thermal shock as, as the piece goes inside the, the kiln and the temperature goes up and, and down. Everything is, is connected together. It's all about expansion, continuity. The, the thesis is called Creative Consciousness, the Art of Al Allowance. Okay, thank you. And then we have, again.
Um, hello, my name is Megan Mosselder. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. I'm really excited to participate in this conversation. Um, I am an international installation artist. Um, it means that I do a lot of travel. My work is largely about space. Um, there is also often a socio-political component to it. So um, I, I literally have built the um, act of travel into my work. I have to go places to make things, essentially. So, other way. <laughs> so, just like Raphael, I do a lot of um, installation work that also um, involves using an element of light. So, this piece was built in Sydney, Australia last year. I was there for a residency for a couple of months. Um, I, this piece was built in a gallery over the span of about a week. Um, so, it's something that can't be recreated anywhere else. So, it, that's a huge component um, to my work is like making um, something that can be entered and uh, traversed um, and it ideally stops the viewer in their tracks gets them to slow down and kind of think about you know the ways in which they are interacting with the space um, and the drawing also I consider these to be drawings within space so depending on where you're, when you are within the, um, the installation uh, it changes around you. This was one of the first insula installations I built in Atlanta, Georgia. I had just moved down from Brooklyn where I finished graduate school remotely. Um, I was interning and working with installation artist Teresita Fernandez who had a huge impact on my work and how I, how I build things. Um, previous to working with her, I was predominantly a painter. Both my um, art degrees are in painting. Um, and I still make paintings, and these installations also have a um, painting component to them. They are hand-painted often um, with an invisible UV that is um, only, uh, you're only able to see it when the black light activates it. This particular piece was called Terminus, which is what Atlanta used to be known as. Um, and I was trying to invoke uh, New York subway tunnels, which I was, and just the concept of um, public transit in general, so there was also a video component to this where we uh, projected um, an image that, or a video that was invoking train travel, and people could walk inside and um, be surrounded by the, the lights. Um, this is a permanent piece. I do a lot of corporate installation work. That's one of the ways I'm able to sustain myself as an artist. Um, I've been out of school for about six years now, and it's something that I've really worked hard to figure out how to do, um, is to create a financially sustainable art practice. So this is a permanent piece that I built for Google and their headquarters in Pittsburgh. Um, it's a two-story piece that's built around a staircase, so the piece kind of grows up out of the staircase, and you're surrounded by it there. This is the first piece that I did. This was my um, MFA show, and this was about um, my experience in Savannah, Georgia, where I initially went to grad school. Um, I was really interested in the socio-political dynamics of Savannah, Georgia, especially in relation to race. Um, and I was working and living near the, the Savannah Bridge, which is, um, that's what everybody calls it, but it's the Talmadge Bridge. Um, which has kind of like a really inf infamous story behind it. And so I was really interested in studying those elements and figuring out a way to have a conversation about what was going on and what I was experiencing in Savannah, Georgia um, with other people. Um, one more time and I'll start. Okay. This is a piece that I build um, at the Arts, Letters, and Numbers. Residency, hit it, like, which one? Thank you. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, that's a very difficult image to see. This was a piece that I built in collaboration with a Manhattan-based composer. Um, it's called Harmonic Sky, um, and it was uh, based on the concept of the mandala. Um, and the, you know, so I built this structure in a barn. It's very hard to see, so. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, but yeah.
that's me, that's my work. And it is a video. It was playing when I tested it. That'd be awesome. This was a pretty cool piece. Um, I built it in the span of like five days. Um, it was a gazebo structure. Then I then installed the string and hand painted the string inside of it that was um, invoking the, um, each of these seven um, um, pieces that... Um, I appreciate you guys trying for me. Thank you. Bummer. It's okay. <laughs> if you guys are interested, you can go to my website and you can see the video there. Um, but the, the piece was, um, this, because of the way the music was interacting with the string, it caused the string to vibrate. Um, and it was this really amazing piece like in um, upstate New York. Um, and there were all these different elements that happened. So. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, this is a video um, that's again kind of working um, with different disciplines. Um, it's a performance, it's an installation, but it was really made to be a video. Um, these are just slides from it. Um, the video is called Naturalized, um, and it's kind of playing with the concept of, you know, where um, is the longing for nature in the very legal and bureaucratic concept of naturalization. Um, and the idea of wanting to physically belong to the land that you are now in beyond just a legal um, attachment. So people were um, very bureaucratically dunked. I can't see my, uh, I think my laser cutter cut. Oh, here it is. Um, sort of, uh, yeah, naturalized into this giant puddle um, with uh, I was the last one. So there's that. We can talk about that more when we discuss, I think. Um, this is, um, again, kind of thinking about language and text and public space. Um, this was a, a piece that I made at a residency in Sweden um, that was kind of playing with the very iconic um, rune stones that exist all over Sweden and all over Scandinavia. And um, I sort of, you know, did um, a lot of research about the text that goes on to these and created my own poem that I then um, turned into a sculptural piece. Um, just kind of working with that idea of, you know, you have this poetry that's like littered all over the natural landscape and how can we work with that now? Um, most recently, I've been working on a lot of um, work around the Great Lakes region and borderland. Um, I lived in Canada, um, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Minneapolis, Montreal. So, um, you know, just have been piecing the region together in a lot of ways. This was a, an installation at um, the five Great Lakes National Parks um, using their sort of templates for signage. Um, but instead, again, of like objective, authoritative information about nature, these are poems that are sort of taking on, in some cases, very literally, the um, language and the sort of, you know, semiotics or whatever, um, or syntax of um, public park signage, but putting poetry in there that's about nature, modernity, identity, um, different people who have lived here and belong here or don't belong here. Um, and then this is a much larger project that I'm sure I'll talk about when we get into our discussion, but um, this was um, a poem that was quite literally written around the entire Great Lakes region at each one of these locations. And you can see that these are the lines that were written at each of these locations, um, either in like string, water, charcoal, um, oftentimes writing in sand. So it's trying to embody this region and sort of tie it together through a narrative that's such a simple thing as a poem, but kind of expanding that to work with the sublime scale of, you know, the planet and um, our continent um, with the very human scale of something like a poem. And this is the beginning of a much bigger project that I'm working on right now that, um, yeah, I could talk about later. Anyway, thank you so much for um, letting me be here. Well, well, thanks everyone for uh, your presentations. Um, I even, I definitely learned something about all of your work um, and look forward to seeing more uh, for sure. Um, but to, to start out the discussion today, um, I wanted to start by asking, you know, it's as I've been in Tulsa now for about two years, and it's been really interesting to observe, even in that time, the changes in growth and cultural, opportun like cultural opportunities and culture in the city, um, including the expansion of the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. And so I wanted to ask each of you, how familiar were you with Tulsa before you came here for the fellowship? And as either you know, someone who's been in this region for a while or as a newcomer, what impact, if any, do you anticipate that Tulsa or Oklahoma has or will have on your work? So, so how familiar with your, were you with Tulsa and how do you think this place might impact your work? To start up any direction. Oh, I'm just looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy okay. for you all to do. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, familiarity with Tulsa. Let's see. Um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, my family moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma, when I was a kid from Egypt, um, and we lived there for a few brief but extremely vivid years, and that's definitely one of the reasons I, I'm back 30-plus years later to sort of look at um, my, you know, immigration experience um, from a thoroughly Americanized point of view. And... Um, 
we, you know, traveled a little bit to Oklahoma City, to Tulsa, to some parks. And so I just have a strangely, like, very personal, but very, you know, short um, uh, memory of it and sort of associations with it, so. Um, this is my second year in the program, and when I first found out that I was accepted, I immediately went, oh, thank goodness, and then I went, Oklahoma? And I was like, I'm not so sure. And all my friends said, you're going where? And they're still like, where are you? Well, that's a common thing with my friends and family. They, when they call me, they say, where are you? Yeah. Um, but so when I, I've been here kind of for a year off and on because I still extensively travel. Um, and I'm... I'm I mean, it, Tulsa has had a huge impact on my work just in the um, enabling me to have the time and space that I need to further develop it um, and just time to rest, too. So it's been a real landing spot um, for me in a lot of ways. Uh, it's still um, having a huge impact. There's been positive impact and there's been some negative impact, but all of those experiences um, largely are helping me to become a better artist, I think. And I'm very grateful to like be surrounded by such a strong community of peers who are also doing similar things. Okay, um, I have been here um, a little bit more than, than, than a month, um, so I'm super new in Tulsa, <laughs> making new friends, <laughs> meeting new artists, new people in general. Um, I was here in October to, to, see, to see the place and I was um, pr pleasantly surprised about what I saw. Um, I mean, I, I, I still ha have to learn more about the, all the, the possibilities. Um, I'm, I'm super happy that I have my studio right next to the ceramic, my personal studio next to the ceramic space. And I'm just starting to do um, um, new things. Um, I was born in Mexico City, so I didn't know, well, and now I live in New York. I, I didn't know much about Oklahoma. Um, one of the funny things is that, um, so I type on the internet, Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> because I want to know what's, what's going on. I see a lot of videos of people fighting and stuff like, oh, I was like, yeah. where, am, where am I going? <laughs> so that, now that I, I'm, I'm, we are on the art district, so I'm very pleased that, uh, how friendly the people have been. And, and, um, and I think more of that should be shown out there, not yep. the, the negative part. Yeah. <laughs> here, here. So like uh, Laura said, I was born in New York State, and my family moved around a lot, but uh, having come to the Tulsa Artist Fellowship again after growing up between the ages of 9 and 17 in Tahlequah, which is pretty near to here. Um, Oklahoma is finally the place I've lived the longest. Um, but um, it's been really interesting as a person um, moving, moving around so much as a kid, having a family that moved around so much. Um, I think everybody in my family is from a different state. Um, so it's sort of always been a thing for us. Traveling has always been a thing for us. Like when I was younger, we just drove across the country and we'd go camping. Um, it's been it's been really interesting watching the way that um, that Tulsa has sort of grown and changed in the last I think even the last ten years, um, having sort of this explosion of building and bringing all these artists in, I think has really changed sort of the landscape, especially downtown, but of the whole city. And I think that's been really wonderful to watch. Um, and I think, like, sort of echoing what I think a lot of my colleagues were saying, having, having a place where I'm based, where I have support, has meant a lot to my work, both by giving me the freedom to work and to make new and bigger and different things, but also um, giving me a community of, of amazingly talented artist colleagues and um, sort of giving me a, a home where I can put down roots, even if it's just for a little while, and like let myself grow in mm. new and interesting ways. Great. Mm. Well, thanks all. And uh, um, 
I you know, also, also wanted to ask, you know, uh, even in the 19th century, before the advent of airplanes and motor vehicles, many of the historic artists here in the Gilcrease collection were very widely traveled. Uh, we had artists like Thomas Moran, uh, Alfred Jacob Miller, George Catlin, who are traversing North America, even going across to Europe, um, seeking new subjects for their work. And uh, like I said, I thought it was an interesting pattern today seeing how um, many artists, but also academics, people in creative fields will often move several times through the course of their career. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, how do you think this pattern of migration affects creativity um, and affects artists today? And also, is there a particular place that has impacted your work? So, and anybody can start. Yeah. Let's all look that way. Yeah. Right. We'll start, we, we can take it. Go the opposite direction. <laughs> like me and Mohab made our choices when we sat down. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I think travel and art is is linked really closely. Um, I think everywhere you go and every person you meet um, is something that, every experience that you have is something that you add to your artistic vocabulary. It, it expands the way that you think about the world and the experiences that you have. Um, it lets you understand things in different ways, which I think is really important. Um, and I think anywhere I've ever been, whether it was a really positive, amazing experience or if I went somewhere and it was awful um, for whatever reason, like those, those experiences have all impacted the way that I think about uh, experience and interact with the world. So that's been really important. I think that's been important for artists for a really long time. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about the way that maybe that has changed some now that we have access to the internet. So. Um, when you know Thomas Moran was painting, like if if you wanted to go paint some cool vistas, you kind of had to like go, go there. Go there. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have sort of the ability to to travel digitally, which is amazing. Um, but I, I think that that ability, while super useful, doesn't replace and can't replace um, the the real experience of going to a new place and. Mm -hmm meeting people there and experiencing differences in culture and um, trying to learn. And all of that stuff changes the way that you make art and um, the things you're trying to communicate about. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, well, again, um, being from Mexico City, I have a, um, a background um, of um, 30 centuries of, of, of culture for all, from all Mesoamerica. And, um, I mean, here in the United States has been um, a wonderful ride. Um, started uh, at the community college where, where I, I was doing like um, painting, drawing, and suddenly I, I discover <laughs> ceramics. I, I find myself spending more time in the ceramic studio and doing more sculpture. Um, so that was... Uh, a very good moment in my life when I moved to to the Maryland Institute College of Art from from um, from a community college to a place that they are all artists. It was a big change to 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 me, you know. And I started seeing things much much more seriously. Then it became the part of where where I started doing residencies. Um, one place that impacted me a lot, it was, um, it was, it's called Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, that's in, um, um, in Maine, so you have, um, it's so far away from, from civilization, <laughs> from any town that you can actually see the, the whole sky, you can uh, <laughs> lay down on those big, big rocks. And then you see the whole, the whole <laughs> galaxy, literally. I, I, I was talking with a friend, she was next to me, and she was like, that's another galaxy, it's something like that. I said, like, she, I don't think we can see as far away to another <laughs> galaxy. But it, is that a, a, those, you see so many stars, it's so dark that you can really, and then, um, this part where, where I started going um, to my master's and getting more serious, more serious. And, um, and now, now I see myself, myself here. It's um, very exciting. I have, I have, uh, I know that everything will be, be great for me and I know I can, I can give a lot for the community with all what I have learned and gathered. Um, throughout my, my artistic path. 
So there, basically there have been different moments that, and, and different places where, where um, that had impacted me so wonderfully. Probably, um, um, I have to acknowledge first that here we have uh, Ms. Julia Weiss, she's the director of the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and she, she um, has helped, helped us a lot. So um, what I'm trying to say is that potentially in this residency, or I mean, sorry, in this fellowship, you, you can be here up to three years. But um, it will be, I will need a little bit of time to, to say that Tulsa, on Tulsa I found this, this thing in particular. Because um, as I said, it just has been one month, a little bit more than, uh, than a month. But I know at a certain point I'm going to uh, be telling people exciting things about Tulsa here. Yeah. Mud, would you like to go or shall I? Oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the place that had, that's impacted me the most was the Cost France. Um, mm. My MFA is my fourth degree. Um, I went back to graduate school to become a teacher um, at the college level. Um, I had taught for four years at a high school in Columbus, Ohio, where I found out that Moab also taught at. Strangely enough. Strangely yeah. enough. <laughs> Um, but I, I went to France and was just completely transformed by this amazing, beautiful vista. Um, I was in the foothills of the Alps. There was lavender fields. It was just gorgeous. Um, and I met Teresita Fernandez, got to you know, work with her, and she said, you're not a painter, you're an artist, uh, you're a large, you're a sculptor. Um, and she encouraged me to make some big dramatic work. And I went out and found this uh, rock pile. It was like the remnants of the Marquis de Sade Chateau and proceeded to wrap over 400 boulders in, in sewing thread to the point where I completely damaged my right arm, couldn't use it anymore for at least six months. Um, and, but this was the, this experience that I had. I was like, this is what I do. This is, and I went back to the United States um, had an internship with Teresita and I you know she's such a successful artist and she was like the real world example that I was looking for and I said what do I need to do what should I do postgraduate school um, and she said you need to do residencies so I had this notion finishing school that I was going to have to travel um, to create the CV I needed to find the opportunities like this one um, and that I was going to be doing it with no money and I was like how am I going to build giant, impressive installation work with no money. I mean, to the point where like, I know how to travel, you know, no money for even like food. It's like, I'm, I've gotten really, I want to write a book about it, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I have some insights. But um, that's why I started working with string, because you can pack a spool string, but it can become this big, otherworldly thing. Um, and that has uh, been a means to an end to establish a portfolio that I've needed to apply to other opportunities. But it's not the end all be all, and it's, but I feel like I'm just at the beginning. Um, we're going to continue to go larger, and hopefully we're going to do physical, uh, like permanent exterior materials. But I think I'll always do string, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your turn. <laughs> um, oh, so much to speak to. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote down migration and creativity. OK. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I um, yeah, that part of the questions uh, is, is speaking to me in a way that kind of isn't about art, and that was something that we talked about, you know, as a group when we met, um, which is kind of like the, um, you know, artists do move around a lot um, these days because of the like increasing professionalization of art, which you know um, I don't know too much about, but there's a um, you know, history of it, right? I mean, there was a time when there weren't a bunch of artist residencies, there weren't a bunch of MFA programs or poetry programs, or um, so you know, you just kind of were really making that work in a really different way. And um, the infrastructure that like pops up around any career is um, you know really like vital for it to continue to exist and to become more democratic and to involve more people in it. But at the same time, it creates um, a you know kind of a, a a bureaucracy and kind of like a you know a, a bit of a vacuum for itself right so um, to sort of be in the position at this day and age where you, you can actually just 
make a career out of residencies, and I don't mean that like cynically, out of them, but through residencies, is really lucky. And yet it still kind of keeps you circulating through art spaces, right? And, and um, building your craft with peers in a different way maybe, whereas before you would have built it in, um, you know, much more like, um, you know, heterogeneous relationships or something. So, you know, I, I think about that a lot um, because maybe I didn't come to art through um, like a fine arts background um, and same with poetry um, because, you know, like what jumped to my mind when you said the place of impact um, was kind of thinking more about m my life in this continent um, and settling here with my family, you know, I sort of latched on to um, the entirety of the Great Lakes region as a place that I consider to be, like, quite honestly, like, I, I intend for that to define my art career. You know, I want to be, uh, you know, I'm working on a poetry manuscript that's about the entire region and thinking about it as a borderland and thinking about it as a bioregion and thinking about it in terms of, you know, multiple controversial settlements, um, histories, and, you know, where does someone who's an immigrant to this continent kind of figure their place and what place is opened up for them to step in? Um, you know, what narratives do you step on when you walk in um, as a first generation person? So these issues of migration, you know, are really just about my life as a person, but, um, you know, we're all figuring out ways that we, like, figure our lives into our artwork uh, as we're also building, you know, a sophisticated body of art that can just live on its own and doesn't need me as the, like, referent the whole time. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, like, if, if I was, you know, um, if I was a refugee or if, you know, my migration was forced, the kind of work that I'd be doing would be completely different than if I'm migrating, you know, just flying around of my own accord. And, and so that, like, that subtext, I think, really affects a lot of um, these issues. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to add to that that um, in the United States, there are around 700 um, residencies and fellowships. Um, so that's a lot. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm talking about that res um, things that could be online, uh, residencies that could be three days, uh, two weeks is very common, that one month is very common, or the three months is kind of common. Um, where we are right now, our fellowship it is potentially up to three years, so it's one of the, the longest yeah. and it provides you with great amount of resources. I mean, it, it's, um, we are very lucky to be part of it. Um, yeah. Well, you, you, with 700 uh, opportunities, actually, you, you could not necessarily need to go to, to, to grad school because, for example, many of those places, they, they, they accept you at any stage of, of your career. But I would argue that they are not all of the same caliber. Yeah. No, no, and the no. The majority no. of them are, um, I would say, even predatory against artists because the amount of money that they charge artists. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. You, you, you have, um, that, that's another thing. You have to, to uh, for example, um, um, read exactly what they what they have the, the facilities what you can potentially be doing there and if you are reading the position to to go there yep. yeah you have to read all those details yeah well which is astonishing to think about with you know some 700 artists residency programs existing across the country um certainly of a wide variety but uh but for the next question I have, it's a, a little bit different, and it's getting at a, a little bit of what uh, Mohab was just, was just mentioning. Um, you know, one of the topics we've covered across the past two days in this symposium is looking at how um, migrations and dislocations, forced migrations, have been a source of historic trauma, a source of stress. Um, of course, here in Oklahoma, we were the destination for the Trail of Tears and for many forced removals of Native people from all across the country. And so, um, as we're grappling with some of these histories, uh, I'd like to ask you know, for, for the panel here, um, how can artists help us process historic trauma today? And how does our understanding of histories um, inspire creative responses? Um, so a lot of my work, I'm just going to jump in because go, go we're just going to keep looking at each other. Um, a lot of my work, I think, deals with um, with with 
personal personal trauma and personal um, personal experiences, but <laughs> in a way that hopefully um, my goal is um, to make pieces that take these very personal experiences and allow them to talk to the personal experiences that other people have. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing that has been um, important to me uh, growing up was the fact that I moved to Tahlequah at a, a pretty young age. Mm -hmm. um, so Tahlequah, I think probably a lot of people here, but some of my actual fellow panelists might not know, Tahlequah is the Cherokee Nation capital. Um, it's sort of the end of the Trail of Tears, which was the, the forced relocation of uh, Native American peoples to Oklahoma. And one of the things that was, I think, um, a valuable about living in Tahlequah in particular is that in a lot of places, um, as we talk about things like the, the sort of like hiddenness of the, the Tulsa Race Massacre in Tulsa and how that was sort of not talked about for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that these, these like traumatic um, violent, like violences that have happened all over the country are often um, sort of buried in a way uh, that the, you know, the majority group of usually like, white people. They don't want to talk about it, and they don't want to remember it, and they don't want to think about it. Um, and so growing up in Tahlequah was, um, I think, interesting and valuable because that, that history is like on the surface, and it's talked about, and it's, it's this, like, that's the story of the town, right? That's like, that's, like the, the story that people think is, and they're correct, is really important to talk about. And I think sort of unburying those those stories in, in different places is really important. And, and one of the things that I think art does really well um, is that it finds ways to talk about, um, about difficult subjects in a way that hopefully people can sort of grasp and um, internalize and have visceral sort of like deep responses to and hopefully not shut that conversation down but instead get it started yeah. again. Good, good place to start a conversation and discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, I go. Um, um, Laura mentioned uh, history, so I want to start there. I hope uh, I, I can explain myself correctly. I want to talk uh, about history. Um, but I w want to say something about language first, so I can relate it to history. So I imagine a language, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to to connect to, to, to the universe, they connect to, to nature, a, a way to say I love you. Uh, each concept represents something different. So when you're learning a language, you are learning not just a vocabulary, but you are learning a new way of thinking, right? Okay, so I want to relate it to history because um, the world history, is completely Eurocentric, and that uh, has been an invention from the last 200 years. So for, for, um, for the other people, including myself, there has been a way of negating uh, our experiences. Um, I'm talking about Latin America, Africa, Asia. And um, it's very unfortunately, um, because um, Civilization didn't start in Europe. That's 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 and that's the way they they teach you, and and that's the way they also teach you uh, how art develop, right? So for me, in part of what I want to give is to to share a, a neo narrative of how things uh, are, or, or, or at least the narrative from, from, from my point of view. So, uh, now in particularly in my artwork, my, my, my thesis are creative consciousness, the art of allowance, that's one, intuitive enlightenment, and dimensions of creation. I came up with this uh, based on, on Max Planck, uh, the father of quantum physics. But um, it has, uh, have, have, um, my ideas have a lot about uh, New Age spirituality. Uh, but I came to this because in, in my personal life, I experienced very uh, difficult things. And, um, 
without telling you the many details, just by f uh, um, finding my, my myself close to to the universe, to to life itself, I, I started learning learning more about how how the the universe behaves. And and for me, my conception is that. That, that the universe is an expansion and continuity and possibilities. So that's what I express in my art. But then, that's how I, 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 I live or, or try to live, uh, be coherent with, with all my concepts and my actions. So conclusion, how we can, uh, after all this story, <laughs> just by, by sharing your personal story and your artwork, people could potentially identify with, with your experience. And as possible, as, as long as we are on this 3D materiality, in this time and space, try to share what we have. Okay. Um, uh, I guess in relation to trauma and history, um, and the way that art can impact that, I believe in the power of art to create dialogue. Um, I don't feel that um, what my limited experience or knowledge, um, I mean, I do have several, but it's not the end all be all. There's lots of things out there, and I believe that I'm, um, the work is not about me, it's about the place. Um, and ideally, it's um, an, an experience that people can um, have a dialogue about that place, um, regardless of their education, um, their, uh, you know, socioeconomical, economical um, status, anything. Like, I, I want people to be able to go in, um, be transformed by the work surrounding the space, and then start to have that dialogue, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I need to stop going at the end of you guys. Yeah. You say so many things that I want to speak to. Um, That's right, next time. You can go that. first next time. Um, you should go first next time. Great, great. Well, I guess, yeah, to, I'm, to, I don't know, to start off more locally, you know, it, it is kind of a little hard to step into a place and then know you have the tools to facilitate understanding or create dialogue or, you know, inspire people um, and to want to, you know, work with your place. But, you know, you don't have the authority to do that yet. Yeah. I mean, you're new. <laughs> um, and it would be really presumptuous of me to come in and, you know, read a book about, you know, Greenwood and then just be like, okay, I'm an artist and I'm going to be able to do something about that. So, right. you know, I just feel like humility in all ways is really vital. And so, um, and sometimes we just take it for granted out of a, a good intention. Um, so I, I don't know, I feel my limits about that, you know. Um, but I continue to see really um, like deep and complex like art here locally and you know talking to people locally who um, just seem to be really tackling some really difficult issues like you know really undaunted so it's really cool to see that and I think a lot of times I personally feel baffled about how art can do that until I encounter it you know right. and um, feel baffled about how I will do it um, but then end up coming at it in a way that I think is really essentially nuanced you know I don't um, to talk about my own work you know I don't feel like I think I could have stepped into this moment in a very different way if I was like what people would consider a political artist or an activist artist um, and I really felt the kind of peer pressure around that post 9-11 as an Arab American person mm. um, the call to defend your identity um, when it's being under attack and continues to be under attack in increasingly kind of, you know, bizarre ways. Um, but, you know, I think I really quickly kind of realized that for all the vilification that happens to a people group I've been relegated to, it's just as like suffocating and stifling to have the people I belong to, quote unquote, um, dictate how I'm supposed to express myself, what I'm supposed to think about, you know, um, to, to con I consider myself like a nature poet, and for people to be like, oh, but you're Arab American, you know, that, that's racism. E even if they want me to speak to racism, um, 
that's a problem, you know, and, and we're, this is just the moment that we're in, and I think it's really forced some really, co like, complex, complex, sort of like intractable problems, like in art today, um, and uh, I just feel like I'm at, at one crux of it, and you, and you can look around at all people groups and you'll find people dealing with it in different ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So, to speak to my work, like, I'm a nature poet, and I'm thinking about nature in modernity. And that's not to say I'm not just making work that's about environmentalism, actually, at all. It's about how does a person come to a new land and figure out what this place is, how to love it, how to be, like, romantically in the, like, you know, nature in the old sense with a capital N. How do we work with that? How can we, like revive the concept of nature as an other instead of just a bunch of resources that we need to save because that's kind of a way forward and it's a way forward because to understand the natural world as an other really expands our ability to think about difference between human others um, you know when people say they belong to a place that's like by definition a more diverse axis of belonging than my homogenous people group. Um, like, you know, people say they're from Chicago. Chicagoans are extremely proud of Chicago. But, I mean, <laughs> those true. are some fierce identity people. But they're so <laughs> fierce about Chicago that it includes 10 different people groups that otherwise, you know, would be, you know, black Chicagoans white Chicagoans, uh, you know, Hispanic Chicagoans, and, and yet there's something about that place. And, and so my question is, when we think about where we are, you know, how big is a place? And how big is a place that we can identify with that will break sort of beyond geopolitical boundaries like states, you know, these very arbitrary yet very complex borders, um, to thinking about belonging together in a place that has many different histories, you know, has changed in so many different ways geographically, you know, um, through weather. And, um, so I guess I see myself as like working like, if you're going to talk about nature today, you're going to have to talk about a lot of different things that have nothing to do with, like, wistful vistas, you know, that, and, and, like, landscape painting, you know? Um, and that's wonderful, because that allows me to really actually get to the heart of what I'm really interested and thrilled about, and, like, what I want to spend my time doing, which is um, thinking about the non-human living world. It, it's just really, like, um, profound and, and, and really personal to me. Yeah. Well, thanks to everyone. I'm, I've, this is, I've gotten some great range of responses from some of the prompts so far, and I think, um, given the time, I'd love to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience. If anybody has questions, I've got I've got one back toward the back. Thank you all. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I want to thank you all for um, your insights so far. It's, it's been very interesting with diverse answers. Um, so I was curious, for a lot of us talking about migrations or dislocations, uh, we're essentially talking about human relationships um, and uh, whether those be you know, between groups of people or individuals. And uh, a lot of you have kind of touched on relationships in some way, talking about a mentor or um, the rejection of some relationship or peoples that you're supposed to, you know, people have told you you're supposed to be talking about. Um, but I was just curious how um, interpersonal relationships, um, whether that be with, with people or non-human people, um, have <laughs> shaped your work. So, Say that again, how relation so how, how, how have particular relationships or in general, you know, interpersonal relationships, how, how do those shape your work? Mm. Um, so, <laughs> I, yeah, we're all just, we're all like, oh no, I don't want to talk over someone. Uh, no. I mean, I, I guess I would go with my teaching. I'm still teaching. I'm currently um, an adjunct professor at Tulsa University. Um, and I, I find the dynamic that occurs in the classroom while I'm working with my students. Um, I present art as a, um, as a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and watching them figure out how to solve the problem helps me figure out my own. Um, so, and that's really important to my practice, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, in my, in, in my case, I, I think I, I, I feel the, some of the stereotypes in the sense that I'm very passionate. <laughs> I'm the head. 
the tem very temper in. So um, in, in when I have teach or have um, I, I see I see that the students see me that that way very passionate very excited about what I'm teaching. Um, for example, at Alfred, Alfred University, I have 19 uh, students in one class and 19 on the other. And um, I, I didn't have a TA, a teaching assistant, so I needed to be <laughs> super aware of everything. And so on top of, of me being kind of hyperactive and trying to, to follow up with everybody, um, I don't know. I think that the, the students really like me. That 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 energy and passion that I put in in my class. Um, I don't know why, but with your question, uh, it came immediately came to my mind this poem by um, a Uruguayan um, writer. His name is Eduardo Galeano. He has a, a, a poem called Los Nadia, the Nobody. Um, so I'll read the nobodies. Oh, the no. um, so I really recommend you to to check that poem. So he talks a little bit about um, how the the one that imposes uh, or has the power, the one that imposes their culture, um, says this. Says uh, uh, what I do is art. So. You are below me, what you do is craft. What, what I have, since I'm in power, mine is religion. Yours, you are below, yours is superstition. Mm -hmm. What I do is culture. And what you have is something else. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the points, it, it's about that, how the relationships of, 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 of power um, develop. No? Okay. So I was thinking about, I have sort of two parts. I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking, and again when you were talking about this poem. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like wh what do we consider art and what do we consider an artifact, and mm -hmm. probably museums have a definition of that. No. Okay. Well, I have it from the source here. Um, constantly changing. <laughs> uh, that, like, that like those lines are super arbitrary and um, often problematic. Um, so in more in response to your question, um, I think all of my art, more or less, all of the artwork that I make is about interpersonal relationships because what I want to do with art, I think what art is, is very important for and useful for, for me, and I think, I think for other artists who I've had conversations with, um, it, it's about communication, right? It's about um, telling a story or, um, or saying something that maybe you can't say uh, as easily in a conversation or uh, with words or in writing, although of course all different artists work through that process in different ways. And so, um, like, how do we communicate with other people at a deep level, and how do we use um, sort of the resources that we have and the, t and the skills that we have to make those communications happen? Um, and and I think I've had a, a number of really important uh, relationships with people who have sort of greatly shifted the way that I think about or consider the world, and that has, has changed the way that I make art in pretty dramatic ways. Um, my undergraduate thesis director was one of those people because she just, uh, she kept pushing me. So I went to school for painting, um, and I, I started making paper clothing because I found a book uh, of, of, it was an art book, like a coffee table book. Um, while I was studying abroad in Italy, I found this book at a museum gift shop of this Belgian artist named Isabel de Borschgrave who makes reproductions of historical gowns out of paper. And I was so fascinated by this idea. Hmm. Um, as a person who's always loved costumes, I was so fascinated by this idea that you could tell stories with clothes and that you could um, just make them yourself out of stuff that you could fold up and keep in your house. Um, and that they could be about telling a story um, or communicating about something deeply personal to other people and making those connections. 
Um, and I just want to add to that Emily has a show opening mm -hmm. uh, for First Friday at 108 Contemporary with mm -hmm. Tolly. Um, what's Tolly's last name? Weinberg. Weinberg, thank you. Yep. Um, and I'm also, I also have a show opening at Living Arts on Friday, so if you'd like to yes. experience it, you should come and check it out. Yeah. Please. And also, if, um, if you'd like to see more of the Tulsa Artist Fellowship in general and of, of, all, of um, all of their work, um, every First Friday, the Refinery Building is open to the public from 6 to 9, and it's at Martin Luther King and Archer in the Arts District. So that will be this coming Friday if you'd like to see what some of the other fellows are doing as well or take a, a look at um, what, uh, what all of these folks are up to. Um, are we about good on time? We're good? Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. They'll, they'll be here if anyone has any follow-up questions, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Slide. Yeah. So we've reached the end of the line and Natalie, Natalie's instructions to me were finish strong. <laughs> and I don't know what that means. I do, I do know that, that it means thanking Joseph Sanchez for all of the tech work. Just tremendous. And, uh, and James Reed for keeping an eye on everybody around here the whole time and kind of everybody else who made this possible. I apologize for not naming every name, but it's been a big group effort, and I, I really appreciate it. In fact, this was a lot of fun for me, and, and my, my thanks to Natalie. So, so what can we say about dislocations and migrations? And I won't take very long. Um, the challenge here will be not only to summarize a wide variety of things, but also to read my own handwriting is kind of problematic. So, you know, at the very top level, why discipline what we've we've noticed a lot of you know variety and disciplinary approaches a big spread and but also at the same time interactions between papers and thoughts that are interesting right in that they um forced us all at least me to think about how these different approaches work together i found that one of the most um interesting parts of this two days was sort of my own act of learning as very different approaches and very different topics were circulating around or piled one on top of the other and I was sort of sitting thinking how do these inform one another and I found that to be an inter interesting intellectual uh, enterprise that really helped me think very deeply about a number of topics like race and identity and power and trauma and recovery and survival and really think as well about um, the connection to the place that we live in now in Oklahoma Indian Territory and thinking about how all of those kinds of concepts play themselves out here and that there are a variety of ways of thinking and understanding about about those dislocations uh, and so that leads led me to think about the importance of place place is a physical touchstone certainly uh, but also as perhaps right um, a sense of longing or imagination and that dislocations and migrations are physical activities and things that we encounter but they're also right of the mind and the heart all at the same time sort of what we make of that uh, I think is part of the conversation here and also part of the creativity and this is where sort of artists came in you all spoke really beautifully about about art and and the sort of role of creative activity in uh, and sort of helping Helping us think about what these physical activities are really all about and indeed the physical place and so there's the imagining there's but also there's the process the act of putting something down on paper or the act of doing research or the act of talking about it or performing it that I think is really it was an essential thing and sort of a thread that ran through all of these panels at least at least for me how people make sense of dislocations and migrations through history and literature and fine art and indeed activism. If you think all the way back to yesterday morning, right, the first panel was about activism, what people are doing right now at a moment in time when migration, dislocation, immigration, place, trauma, power, are all being manifested right in our community and on the bodies of individual people right so there's that aspect too and so that really thinks caused me to think about the applied dimension of all of these kinds of things and that sometimes the way that we the way we separate the creative acts and the arts from 
the living experience and life and activity really is a quite artificial thing, right? All of the documents, all of the paintings, all of the objects that we have in these collections were created by people in a moment of time, often in response to something that's happening in their world at that point in time. Those could be dislocations, they could be migrations, but they also could be questions of, of, of aesthetics and beauty and you know the whole range of sort of emotions. So there's a connection between what we have in these archives and the museums and the creative work and the inquiry that we've talked about. And that speaks to this notion of how collections are enlivened by use. And use is shaped by the questions that we raise and share with one another, right? So the collections are old and new and we're creating all the time, but right in this context of sort of a ever right larger soup, sort of super gumbo of kinds of things that are coming together. Oftentimes in the academy, we talk about the disciplines and interdisciplinarity. And certainly that's a kind of a key word of this symposium. Sometimes interdisciplinary is interdisciplinarity is described as removing barriers between the disciplines, removing barriers between the ways that people from different backgrounds and intellectual traditions and homelands work on their, engage their ideas. And the idea, at least in some sense, is that in the future, new discoveries will be made between disciplines, right? We often hear this, right? That in the future, we're gonna, the creative work's gonna happen in these sort of places between all of these various kinds of activities and traditions. I think there's something to that, but I actually think that over the last two days, I feel like that kind of misses the point, really, for, rather profoundly. It seems to me that the value of mixing disciplines together is not in the homogenization of knowledge or in the desire to find a grand unified theory of knowledge or, or a knowledge of everything, but precisely in the disciplinary traditions and distinctions and diversity themselves. So I found valuable about this, not in the way that everything sort of mixes together and becomes one thing and erases distinctions, but in fact just the opposite, that listening to very different ways of understanding and different kinds of intellectual traditions and different questions, profoundly different in some cases, was in fact what was enlightening to me. It's not mixing things together, it's all of it. And so sort of sitting and listening to psychologists and thinking about the way they engage their practical work and then listening to creative activity here and sort of imagining what that is, those aren't the same thing. Right? They're the same in that they're human endeavors, but it strikes me that really the power of this lies in the diversity of human experience, the diversity of intellectual traditions and cultural traditions, and maybe in some ways the, um, the power, not only in dislocations and migrations, right, but in the way that we come to understand right, their importance for our own lives, not in creating one right outcome, but in respecting multiple outcomes. So that's the best I can do. I don't think that's thinking very strong, very, that's finishing very strongly, but I do appreciate everybody who stuck this out and who's here at this afternoon and mostly our fantastic presenters and let me add, the panel chairs who built all of these programs. Remember, we tried something new. We flipped the script this time. Rather than a small committee deciding who's gonna come out here and talk, we went to experts in a variety of fields and we said, you, Build a, build a panel, bring some people that you find interesting to the forefront, and then we'll figure out, right, how to finish strong, okay? So thank you very much, and we hope to see you again soon when we try this again, once Natalie and I recover from all of it.